Hey, this is Connor from Biker's Edge. Today I am running over coil versus air shocks in another kind of pseudo scientific bike test. I'm running them through a bunch of different tests to kind of find where each one shines and help you guys decide which one's going to be best for you. So if you want to find out, stick around. Awkward rocks. So the test works like this. I have an IBIS RIPMO, which is now coil compatible with certain coils. The only variable is the shock, and I'm running the stock Fox DPX2 air shock as the air shock. I'm running a DVO Jade coil as the coil option. The tests for today are going to be a kind of techy rocky downhill, a flowy downhill, the climb back up to the top of those downhills, um, pump track, jumps and a flat out sprint. I kind of figure that will give me a really good impression of how each shock will perform in a bunch of different terrain. I'm, I'm going to do as many laps as possible so I get good averages so the numbers are semi-reliable. All the testing's done. I've done so many laps and I've crunched all the numbers. Uh, I, I am very tired, I don't want to do that again, but I think we've got some kind of interesting information here. Um, it's not quite as apparent as I was hoping. Uh, it's not a clear-cut answer that one's better here, one's better there. Everything's honestly fairly similar. It comes down to pretty subtle differences and mostly comes down to ride feel and preference rather than time and which one's faster. I honestly, I wish I had a better answer. I wish I had more definitive times, but it just isn't that way. So we're gonna kind of dive into what makes each shock unique. All right, we're gonna start with the uh, flowy downhill. Uh, this was the tightest time difference. There really wasn't much between either one in, in terms of time. In terms of feel, they were fairly different. This was a pretty standard flow trail, had some drops, some jumps, ton of berms, braking bumps, you know, all the, the stuff you're going to find on your everyday flow trail. So my average time on the air shock, it was slightly faster. There's really not much in it. It was 110.1. And my time on the coil shock was 110.4. So three tenths of a second. Can't really say one's faster than the other there. I had an easier time clearing all of the jumps on the air shock and on some of the drops that maybe I went a little deeper the bottom out was more controlled where on the coil I did kind of clang through all the travel just a little bit more I it was less comfortable I had a few where my ankles were hurting um, where I didn't experience that at all on the air shock it ramped up more and it felt more comfortable on those flatter landings and again like I said it was easier to clear the jumps in the first place not that the coil was overly difficult, I still felt that it was fairly poppy and lively until I rode the air shock and then the difference became rather apparent. Oh, I'm getting rattled. So now let's jump into the tech trail where you really think that the coil shock would shine. You know, you think, oh, Rocky coil shock for the win always. Um, and while it was slightly faster, there really wasn't much in it. Again, this trail had a little bit of everything, had some tighter corners. It had a few more technical features, a couple rock gardens. Overall, there's probably about 15 to 20 seconds of rocky terrain. Again, time was really tight on the coil shock. It was 119.4 and on the air shock, it was 120.6. So just a tiny bit over one second, I think it's a difference of 1.4%. So nothing big, nothing drastic. I was curious about how much faster it was in the rocks. So I did break down just the rocky section of the whole timed bit. Um, and the coil was faster there. The air shock on average was 1.3% slower in all of the rocky sections. So it must've been making up time somewhere else to you know, kind of keep that time gap close in the overall. The coil shock, I did notice it was easier to just let off the brakes, stay on my line, and not have to make these little adjustments and not have to worry about the bike bouncing around. 
it helped the bike stay glued to the ground and kept it exactly where I wanted it. I didn't have any kind of sketchy weird moments where on the air shock I did notice the bike was bouncing kind of side to side just a little bit more and then reviewing the footage you can see it the the coil shock stays nice and grounded and just kind of pitter patters through everything climb coil now so jumping into the climb section um, here you would really think the air would be a lot faster than the coil shock but most of your pedaling performance from a bike comes from the bike itself and how that suspension platform is designed not so much what's controlling the suspension and the coil shock on average probably weighs about a pound more than an equivalent air shock so over a short climb like mine it, it's pretty insignificant over a long climb yeah you'll probably feel that extra pound the air shock was slightly faster at two zero zero point one and the coil shock was at 202.2 .2. so two seconds slower over a two minute climb one and a half percent difference really not much in it also i didn't time this one um, i should have this is more just kind of a ride feel thing i rode a pump track for multiple laps on each shock um, the air shock felt easier quicker in and out of corners it was easier to gap the doubles um, than it was on the coil i don't tell anyone but i i front cased a double on the coil it wasn't great so the coil shock did feel slower i felt like you got a little less return in and out of corners where you wouldn't generate quite as much speed as you would on the air shock All right, this is the test that I really hated. It was the flat out sprint. I just sprinted across the parking lot as fast as I could on both shocks um, multiple times and it sucked. Here, I think the difference was a little more noticeable in ride feel and time as well. Even though the times were tight, the percentage difference is a little bit bigger than everything else. Um, the air shock was a little quicker to get the bike going and then I wasn't bouncing up and down as much with that full flat out sprint effort. Uh, the coil tended to bounce up and down. The bike accelerated just a little bit slower. All right, so the air shock, a little bit faster at 16.2 uh, seconds. And the coil shock was 2.2% slower at 16.66 seconds on average. Not a huge difference, but the percentage is slightly larger than everything else. Oh, case that one real good. All right, so the clock isn't the entire story. There are some things I just kind of time, and here the times were just so tight, it didn't really give me a clear answer. So I tried to dig into things just a little bit more to kind of hopefully find a better answer. So I counted how many times I cased jumps. Um, ideally, I would never have to admit in public that I've cased a jump in my entire life. But here we go, you know, I'm putting it all on the line for science, so you're welcome. On the coil shock throughout the entire filming process of the day, I cased eight jumps. You know, it's out of 10,000. Don't make me feel bad. Um, and I cased two jumps on the air shock. Now I could kind of quantify how much poppier that air shock was. It was a lot easier to clear jumps, even with less effort uh, on the air shock than it was the coil. And like I said earlier, the coil shock felt fine. It felt poppy enough and playful enough until I put the air shock on. And once I had that air shock on, it was night and day difference. The other one, I've kind of touched on it earlier, is bottom out support. Um, I did notice more hard clangs or hard bottom outs on the coil shock than I did on the air shock. And by nature, that's just how coils work. They're linear. Uh, it's potentially as easy to go through the first third of travel as it is the last third of travel. There's no ramp up like you have on an air shock. So I did have, there was one in particular, hit a drop, went a little deep, and ankles and wrists just felt pretty sore honestly where on the air shock I never had one of those moments and like I said I was going deeper and further off of jumps and drops anyway so the conclusion on this one it's not super definitive one way or the other um, I've always kind of fancied myself as a coil guy I like going through rocks fast I like going through roots fast um, I've always kind of liked that grounded planted feel 
until I rode them back to back. I honestly enjoyed the AirShock on the Ripmo more than I did the coil for 95% of what I rode, with the small exception being the 100 feet of rock garden. Um, everything else, I'll, I'll take the AirShock. I'll take that more lively, energetic ride quality than I will that kind of grounded, planted, hate to say dead, but dead feeling coil shock. There are a couple other things that air shocks have going for them. They're easier to set up. You just add air, remove air. Uh, you have the same knobs and twisties and buttons and stuff to, to change, just like you would on a coil, but changing your spring rate is as easy as plugging in a, a shock pump and adding or removing air. Where on a coil shock, you have to buy a different spring. Um, other things about air shocks, like I said earlier, you can fine tune that bottom out support. You can add or remove volume spacers to have a more linear or more progressive feel to your shock. Air shocks, again, are lighter. Uh, you know, a pound, about almost half the weight of a coil shock. And honestly, the biggest thing an air shock has going for it is it's probably the shock that came on your bike. You don't have to spend extra money to get it. It's just there, you have it. So I guess what I'm getting at with all of this is that 90% of people out there will probably be happier on the AirShock that came with their bike, with some exceptions. Um, racers, people who are riding rough, nasty terrain and need that glued, planted, more traction feel to it. Uh, I, I think those folks can definitely benefit from a coil shock. Also, the people who just don't care about jumping, they kind of like the dead feel of a bike, the grounded, really quiet feel. Um, some people just really enjoy that, and I think to get that, kind of need a coil shock. Air shocks do okay, but they can't touch the coil in that department. Ideally, if your bike is compatible and it fits the budget, having both would be amazing. You know, it takes a couple minutes, like two to three minutes to swap out the shock, and it would almost feel like you've got two different bikes. You know, you've got this one really lively, poppy, energetic, fun bike for most of your riding. But then you've got a gnarly race or a bike park weekend coming up. Throw on the coil shock and take that extra traction and extra control. So, bottom line, I think 90% of everybody out there riding would be happy on an air shock. Um, the 10% or those exceptions, they sure, grab the coil shock, it's going to be awesome for you. And then if you can have both, have both. So thanks for sticking around. If you think I got it wrong and you think I'm crazy and everybody should be riding coil, let me know. Um, let's you know start a little discussion here and hopefully be able to, to guide people to a more definitive answer than what the clock gave us today. We'll see you next time.